Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for coming to the press conference uh, just before the weekend. Um, Japan is assuming the president of the Security Council for this December. And today we will have um, Ambassador Besho, a uh, permanent representative of Japan, will briefly talk about the program of work and uh, the priorities of the Japanese presidency. And after his remarks, uh, we will open the floor and Ambassador Besho will take some questions from you. So please, Ambassador Besho. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk to you before our presidency really kicks off. Um, as this is my second time being the president of the Security Council, I, I had the privilege of being the president just after I arrived uh, last uh, in July of last year. Uh, it was uh, for me uh, an experience suddenly being. Uh, put into that role. Uh, since then, I have had the um, pleasure of working with the Security Council for um, over a year, and I have uh, managed to uh, learn a lot from the presidents uh, of uh, different countries. So I would this time like to um, build on my experience, uh, whereas at the same time I would like to uh, carry on with some of the, uh, uh, well, the new tradition that I've trying to build up. The first one is, of course, um, I have tried to be as transparent as possible. Um, July of last year was a difficult one in that case uh, because of the selection of the Secretary General. But um, nevertheless, I think you noted that I, every time we had a consultation, I came out to speak to you at the stakeout. And I intend to carry on that, uh, well, tradition, at least tradition of mine. Um, so uh, having said that, uh, I would just like to quickly explain to you um, what we uh, expect to do this month. Um, December is always a very difficult month because it is short. Um, the uh, Christmas time and afterwards is very difficult as far as uh, planning meetings are concerned. Um, so we have planned meetings to finish more or less by the 21st of December. 22nd, uh, we'll have the wrap-up sessions. And after Christmas, uh, obviously, the Security Council is on standby for any matter that needs to be dealt with by the Security Council for peace and security in the world. If I may, you have uh, each a copy of the program of work, I trust. Um, today is uh, Friday, so the actual work starts from next week. Um, we have uh, quite a lot of things that are being carried on from uh, last month and uh, before that. But um, we have three main topics, three main themes that we would like to pursue during the month of December. The first being the uh, DPRK issue. Um, we have uh, had some silence uh, from them as far as provocative actions are concerned. But as you know, um, this week we had the long-range missile ICBM uh, launch, which have again uh, gathered the attention of the world. And we feel that uh, it needs to be discussed. We did have a emergency meeting on it, but uh, uh, we are hoping to have a meeting uh, on the 15th uh, briefing. It says non-proliferation DPRK, and we hope to do this at the ministerial level. Um, <clears throat> the second theme uh, is uh, that we are uh, hoping to pursue is the small arms and little, uh, um, little weapons. Uh, this is a, meet, a briefing on the 18th, afternoon of the 18th. Um, small arms are not often 
discussed in the Security Council, but uh, you may recall that in 2015, uh, a resolution was passed in which it was asked that the Secretary General um, provides a once in two years a report uh, of uh, uh, the small arms. And it remains a fact that many of the civilians killed in conflict are killed by small arms. So um, this is a serious issue that needs to be addressed. Uh, the awareness of the international community needs to be heightened. And we are hoping that we can have a useful discussion um, on this. Um, Japan has been uh, interested in this small arms for a long time. Uh, and we happen to be a, in the presidency of the um, arms, uh, arms Trade Treaty at this moment. So we feel that this is very timely. Um, we do uh, plan a, an open debate as well. Uh, this is not at the ministerial level, but it's on the 20th, you may see. It says maintenance of international peace and security. This is a general topic. And then uh, after column, addressing complex contemporary challenges to international peace and security. Now, um, it's uh, a long agenda item. Uh, what we wanted to do was to note the fact that many of the conflicts that we see in the world today are not the traditional uh, conventional conflicts of one country versus another country uh, because of uh, you know, territorial issues or things of that nature but uh, have very many different diverse root causes. And in order to tackle the situation, we do need a, an approach which looks at the long term and trying to make sure that we build peace as much as stop conflict. And what would be even better is to prevent conflict. So this actually, in a way, uh, coincides always or try to address some of the issues that the Secretary General has uh, tried to or is trying to address in his uh, reform for peace and security. So those are the uh, three thematic points. Um, we uh, have, of course, as I said at the outset, uh, several very important uh, regional issues. Um, as you can imagine, uh, one would, is the Syria issue. Uh, in all three aspects, um, we have the political process dialogue, which uh, started in Geneva. Um, it was very slow to move, uh, uh, as we see it. So we do want it to move on. Uh, we have the chemical weapons issue. Uh, last month, we had this uh, couple of days in which we had three draft resolutions, none of them being passed, and the gym was ended. So um, we have to do something about this. Um, I think there is agreement, consensus in the Security Council that use of chemical weapons is not permissible under any circumstances, and that the perpetrators, perpetrators need to be held to account. We should not allow impunity. And I think there is also a, a consensus that we do need, the security needs to find a way to make that possible, that is, to make sure that we prevent impunity. Uh, what we have not been able to agree on is how we do it, what kind of mechanism we uh, set up for that. And uh, the discussion will continue on that. Um, on the humanitarian side, Syria humanitarian side, um, obviously uh, we had hoped that uh, setting up of de-escalation zones would make it easier for humanitarian 
access to be improved. Um, there is, uh, there has been, of course, uh, improvement, but certainly not satisfactory. So there will be a discussion on that. Um, on Myanmar, uh, there was a presidential statement uh, issued last month, which asked for a, a report from the Secretary General in 30 days. Uh, that will be coming up uh, earlier, early this month. So um, I believe there will be a, a well, um, active discussion following up on that report. Um, there are so many other issues, but I think I'll stop there and open the floor for any questions or comments. So we like to take questions. Mr. President, uh, a warm welcome, and on behalf of the UN Correspondents Association, thank you very much for this briefing, and we wish you well in the month of December. I'm Sherwin Bryceby, South African Broadcasting. I've got three questions, but two are housekeeping questions. Uh, who's confirmed for the ministerial on the 15th? Can you give us a little more information on that? Um, do you expect a product to be uh, adopted at that ministerial? And my final question is Nikki Haley's comments about utterly destroying uh, the DPRK if war breaks out. What will, are the implications of an utterly destroyed DPRK for a neighboring country, country like Japan? Um, well, uh, for the meeting on the 15th, um, we have some um, RSBP answers uh, by uh, the minister at the ministerial level. Um, as for Japan, uh, what we foresee is for the foreign minister, uh, Mr. Uh, well, I mean, he, he is, uh, he plans to come. Um, I think uh, that is more or less a starting point. Uh, we uh, foresee several other ministers coming um, f to attend. Uh, I don't think I'm at liberty to disclose specific names at this moment, but several ministers will be coming and some deputy ministers. Um, the um, product, well, um, we are discussing uh, uh, amongst, well, in, in the Security Council um, at the working level what we should come up with. Um, it is still being debated, um, but we are trying to have some, some product. Uh, at this stage, uh, we're not too sure what it will be. Well, as for Ambassador Haley's uh, statement, I think you have to ask her. <laughs> The question is, what are the implications of an utterly destroyed DPRK? Well, I mean, that is a very, uh, no, that, the, what is it, uh, what is it in English? Uh, it's, it's, that question is based on what if, and I don't think I should be answering that question in that way. Hypothetical. Hypothetical, sorry. Thank you so much. <laughs> Rhonda Haubin, and I write uh, for tats.de, and I have um, also at times in South Korea, I have some publications. Um, my question is about the meeting you're planning on the 15th. Mm -hmm. Article 32 of the charter says that the DPRK should be invited. I'm wondering if anybody has suggested that or, pr or promoted that, and what your view is of that and whether that is a possible, you know, is something that you feel that the charter is explicit about, and therefore um, something to pay attention to. Well, uh, as for um, countries wishing to take part in Security Council meetings, uh, the provisional rules of uh, procedure of the Security Council provides for that. If there is a wish voiced in accordance with that, obviously we will, um, you know follow the procedure. Okay, I just have a follow-up because I know Japan has paid a lot of attention to how the Security Council functions mm -hmm. and is, is, that's a very good thing. But if you um, look at the history of Article 32, basically Article 32 says they are to be invited, whereas the rules of, provisional rules of procedure say when um, they can ask. And so, and in fact, they have asked in terms of sending letters about some of the problems that they see as causing the trouble. So I'm, I'm just wondering why the Security Council has diverted from that and why Japan has not, you know, as part of the work you do about reforming the methods of work. This is a very big breach because it's due process and it's inviting, they have come, 
when they were invited at some time. So can you say why uh, this is, you tell me about the provisional rules instead of look, you know, enforcing the uh, Article 32, thank you. Yes, well, I mean, you are aware of Article 32. I think everyone else is aware of 32. Um, here it says, um, well, it talks about the dispute and a party to the dispute. We're talking about what North Koreans DPRK is doing, uh, which is very uh, a threat to the safe peace and security stability of the region and the world. And this is the way it's being handled. Um, and I can say that um, I'm sure the president, consecutive presidents of the uh, Security Council has always had an open mind about all of this, but they have not come to us at least to say that they want to attend. And so as far as we are concerned, um, we'll see how things develop and um, we will follow the procedures of the Security Council. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, first let me follow up my colleague's question. Could you tell, just tell us as a matter of fact, Japanese self-defense def forces, in the wake of an American attack on North Korea, what is the estimated casualties in Japan? That's my follow-up question. My own question is, as a philosophical matter. Sorry? As a philosophical, philosophical matter. matter. <laughs> philosophical matter. You arrived here in July of last summer when we had two Wansung-14 missiles launched. The middle of this week, a much more powerful 15 version of considerable sophistication was launched, landed not that far from your homeland. Thinking about that and all the noise you have heard, all the rhetoric from the Americans, is there anything more than talk going on to secure your homeland in the Security Council? Um, thank you. Um, the first question, as I said, uh, it, it is a thank you for the word hypothetical question, which I, I would decline to, to, to answer. Obviously, Japan is doing its best in itself to try to defend its people the lives of those people and its uh, homeland. Uh, but uh, um, as far as your question is concerned, it is too hypothetical to answer. Um, the Hwasong 15, they call it this time. Uh, yeah, there have been many, many uh, missile launches. Uh, we've had um, nuclear tests as well. This is definitely a very very strong threat to the security and safety of Japan. I have said this many times, uh, not just in the Security Council, uh, but in the open as well. I think the awareness of the international community concerning this question has been heightened very much. And we are, uh, as a council, uh, working towards the way in which the peaceful way of putting pressure on North Korea so that they would change their policy. And it's not just condemning them. We have tried to take away the resources they're spending or the resources meaning not just financing, but also the material that they use uh, for or building a nuclear arsenal. And uh, so I am grateful for what the Security Council has been doing in the past year and a half, and, but we certainly need to do more. The last uh, resolution that we have adopted concerning DPRK, that is 2375, I believe that is a very robust resolution. Uh, we hope that that will begin to take more effect and we hope that the whole membership of the United Nations will faithfully implement this resolution because I think it is a very good resolution. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, what are, uh, the, what do you want the Security Council to take additional measures? What are the measures that can still be taken 
from the Security Council in your point of view regarding uh, North Korea. Also, are you willing to address the demands from China and Russia to hold the military exercise with the United States and uh, in that uh, part of the world during this heightened uh, tensions in, in that part of the world. Uh, also on Syria, uh, if you uh, don't uh, mind, on chemical weapon. Yes. Is it going to be dead in the Security Council if the, you're not able to reach an agreement this month? Thank you. So, sorry, what was your last question? What so, is, is the chemical weapon mm -hmm. um, uh, issue uh, going to be removed from the Security removed. Council uh, agenda if you are not able to agree on something this month? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, first of all, um, on the EPRK, what uh, additional measures uh, we would like? Um, Obviously, the Security Council remains seized of the issue. Um, we are, Japan is talking with our friends, ally, and uh, partners, um, regional and global, in trying to find the best way to have DPRK change their policy. Uh, now, Security Council is just one arena that may be useful. Uh, we are talking with our colleagues about what would be the best uh, way of doing things, but it's, it's a whole strategy that we need to talk about. At this moment, we do not have anything that we can disclose to you as uh, something additional by the Security Council. Um, <clears throat> The military exercises that uh, China and Russia have talked about, I think it's basically a uh, bilateral joint exercise between ROK and United States. Um, I don't think there has been mention of the uh, Japan-US uh, exercises that, of course, we conduct as part of our normal uh, you know, self-defense uh, uh, routine. And um, obviously, we would need to make, keep, maintain our defense posture and uh, to uh, build up our capacities as necessary. On Syria, um, well, I, I don't think there's a question of uh, the uh, Syria chemical weapons item being removed from the agenda. Um, how it will be treated uh, in the days to come, in the weeks to come, I, I cannot foresee. What I can say is that this month we will certainly be discussing it and uh, we hope we'll get a good resolution by the end of this month. If not, we should continue our discussions. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador Edith Lederer from the Associated Press. Um, a few housekeeping details. Um, if you're looking at the uh -huh. calendar, um, who's going to be briefing on Yemen on the 5th and on Myanmar on the 12th? And on the 15th, um, I assume that this is going to be an open an open ministerial meeting where all the ministers will speak. But are you planning any kind of um, closed meeting of all of the ministers? And I'm asking this because the Russian ambassador suggested at the um, meeting um, on North Korea, on the North Korea missile launch, that what really needs to happen is that key leaders and powerful people need to sit down together and actually discuss what can be done um, about a diplomatic and political solution, not just giving speeches. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, on the, what you call, housekeeping issues, on Yemen, on the 5th, uh, it'll be the Special Envoy Ismail. 
Um, on the Myanmar, uh, is, we foresee USG Feldman, who has, of course, visited uh, Myanmar recently. And on the 15th, uh, we uh, have asked the Secretary General to, to brief the uh, Security Council. Um, now, as I said, there, there will be some ministers coming. Um, the, it's, it's a briefing, meaning it will be basically just the Security Council members, and perhaps uh, are okay. Uh, but of course, there will be some bilaterals, obviously. And even without looking at this 15th of December, there are dialogues going on. Uh, I think Ambassador Haley herself mentioned this telephone call between President Trump and President Xi Jinping. And uh, my, my Prime Minister has been talking on the phone with key leaders. There's a lot of discussion going on. It's, well, I mean, I'm in the Security Council, so I, I look at the Security Council and uh, you know, try to do my best in the Security Council, but there are other things happening in the world. Sorry, but you're not planning anything like uh, a private meeting after after the open meeting or even a lunch for all the ministers where people can speak a little more informally. Well, I, I haven't, we haven't really thought about the lunch yet, but <laughs> maybe there's lunch, uh, but I think... <laughs> <laughs> Some, some suggestions. Um, no, um, seriously, um, I can foresee some serious bilateral meetings taking place, and I'm sure um, people will take use, make use of this opportunity. But as I said, this is not the only opportunity. It's, it's going on. People don't have to wait until the 15th. Okay, I'll take two questions. Ambassador, I wanted to ask about the, um, the request that you received from nine countries, including Japan, to hold a human rights meeting mm -hmm. on North Korea, which um, we understand might be held on the 11th. Can, can you confirm the date? And also, um, this would be the fourth year that there's this annual debate, mm -hmm. and uh, do you expect it to be uh, the same as the previous years, to have a procedural vote? Um, and uh, what, can you talk a bit about the purpose of this meeting, given that every year uh, we've heard very important statements, but really beyond the statements, uh, I'm not sure how the Security Council is dealing with the human rights crisis in North Korea. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Um, yes, uh, there is a wish on the part of, uh, uh, I'm talking now as the President, on some um, Security Council members who uh, would like to have this meeting. Um, now, so, so the, the, as president, I think I'll be calling a meeting. Um, yes, you mentioned the date 11th. That is one opening that you would see in the calendar, but we'll have to decide on that. Uh, one thing that I, I need to tell you is that it, it's not on the POW because it's not decided yet. And uh, if we have not decided uh, to have this uh, on an agenda, fixed agenda, it will not come up in the, even in the journal. Um, now, we, uh, well, the question, what, what, what are we going to do about uh, it afterwards? I think the most important thing that we need to do is to make sure that people understand this nexus between the human rights, humanitarian situation in North Korea and their nuclear weapons development. Um, it is quite clearly written uh, in the human rights resolution for DPRK that there is this connection. Uh, the Security Council has also pointed it out that we feel that the, secu the Security Council 
uh, should take note of the fact that such human rights, humanitarian issues have a great to do, deal to do with this security and safety in the region. Uh, we have uh, different thematic uh, uh, meetings in which it's important that we get the understanding of the international community that it is a problem that we should be addressing it. Um, we do not foresee uh, 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 any specific action coming out of it, perhaps, but I think it is very important that the international community discuss this issue and raise awareness of the world that this is indeed a problem, not just for countries around North Korea, but within DPRK as well. Thank you, Carla Stay, Global Research. Um, I'm very concerned about the fact that um, there's an irresponsible use of rhetoric uh, by certain members of the Security Council, and the double standards are becoming a point. I, all credibility is being lost. Um, and also, there's a lack of historical context to any of the th thinking. North Korea actually has never been an aggressor. Um, as you know, they were colonized by your country. And my country pulverized the entire, North, the entire Korea in the 1950s. And North Korea has nuclear weapons because they are threatened by my country. I'm American. And so to say that they are a threat to the entire globe seems to me to be hyperbolic of irresponsible proportions. Also, all five permanent members of the Security Council are in violation of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, Article 6. My country is in violation of Article 1, which says you... The question is, is how can you reverse what appears to be um, a, a situation that will end up with military action against North Korea, the sanctions, as the Swedish ambassador pointed out during the meeting, are having a very devastating effect upon the people in North Korea. Um, the human rights rapporteur, Mr. Quintana, pointed that out, uh, and I actually mentioned this to the Swedish ambassador yesterday. The question is, there is such a a conspicuous uh, and one-sided. Well, what can you do to what can you do to um, <coughs> to provide some form of justice for a country that's a target? What's the question? Um, yes, I, I would like to make a few comments. First of all, as the president of the Security Council. Uh, so, the factual question, uh, has DPRK never been aggressor? Well, look, at, look back on the Korean War and tell me what happened there. I'm not a historian, I'm not going to go any further than that, but there was actually conflict there, confrontation there. So, you can't say that it's a totally peaceful place, nothing is happening. Secondly, still as president of the Security Council, they have violated, one, the MPT Treaty, and two, the fact that they have, they are the only nation in the world in the 21st century to have tested nuclear, te have uh, used nuclear tests. That needs to be taken into account as a fact. And now just stepping back a little bit as, I think I can say it as a president too, but I was talking my own national capacity. Uh, North Korea have launched missiles in direction of Japan. Some have dropped before us, some have gone over us, and some, quite a number, have dropped in the exclusive economic zone. Some have been covered by TV footage as when it's dropping. And I, I think it's very 
easy to say that they are disrupting peace in the region. Um, I forgot your question. What was it? <laughs> Sorry. The Security Council has, has dealt with the fact that the U.S. and the ROK have repeatedly had provocative military are entitled decapitation of the head of state. And this has never been addressed, has never been, um, has never been, uh, what can I say? The Security Council has never attempted to get the U.S. and the ROK to stop provocative military exercises. Well, yeah, I, I think I get the, uh, what you were trying to say. Um, one, one other thing, <clears throat> the effect of sanctions. I was speaking a few minutes ago about what the North Korean government is doing to its people. They are depriving, in spite of the fact that there is great need on the part of their, the people living in North Korea, they are depriving resources from being used for the welfare of the country, of the people, and pouring it into this nuclear weapons development. So before talking about effect of sanctions, one should realize that it's the regime, it's the government that is hurting its own people. Um, now, what we can do to try to change the situation? Well, I think um, what, what, I was not quite sure what you meant by the situation, but I feel that what is important is that North Korea changes its course, stop the nuclear development, stop this <clears throat> missile development and use the resources for the most useful purpose of building a peaceful democratic nation uh, and giving the people a chance to live in peace and, and uh, uh, you know, being afforded the public services that, that they deserve. Thank you. My name is Abdul Hamid Sayam from the Arabic daily Al-Quds Al-Arabi that is based in London. I have uh, two questions, Mr. President, one on Palestine and one on Myanmar. On Palestine in 2003, Security Council adopted resolution 1515 calling for the two-state solution. We are 14 years later. Do you still believe honestly and precisely there is a chance for the two-state solution after all those settlements and settlers occupying more land in Palestine. And in Myanmar, the High Commissioner for Human Rights called it a textbook ethnic cleansing. Doesn't that worth a resolution by the Security Council, only a presidential statement? Why the Security Council doesn't listen to Pramela Patton, the SRSG for sexual violence in, in areas of conflict, at least invite her to speak to the Security Council. She spoke about raping thousands of Rohingya women. Thank you. Um, you had two questions, one on the Palestinian issue. Well, I think uh, if you listen to the discussion in the Security Council when it's done in the open chamber, many, I would say all uh, members at present talk about the necessity to have the two-state solution and the necessity to make sure that we maintain the environment making it possible to have a two-state solution. There are uh, members, uh, quite a number of membership, who feel that it is being eroded, that we should uh, try to uh, make a change there but uh, um, I cannot speak as a president as to whether I believe that a two-state solution is possible or not. But I can say in my national capacity that we believe that is the only solution and we should be working for it even harder. On Myanmar, um, obviously, uh, um, we do have this uh, presidential statement, as you said. It was a way forward uh, that we could agree on and it does provide some, where shows some way forward. We'll be having another discussion um, uh, this month. So um, as a president, I hope that we will be able to have a constructive meeting 
uh, to show the way forward. And I think that's all I can say as a president. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. I'm uh, Alex from Tokyo Shimbun. Uh, in Japan's talks with its friends and allies, has there been any talk of additional sanctions as an option in moving forward, or are they completely off the table? Um, I, I think you heard me speak at the chamber. So I, I'm talking as um, my national capacity. I hope you will read what I said. Uh, I was talking about uh, maintaining maximum pressure on DPRK so that they would change their policy and um, you know, making the way for a peaceful solution. Um, not in so many words, but that was, I think, my uh, very clear message from me. And uh, <laughs> as a president of the Security Council, uh, you've heard different views. And I don't think I can go any further than that. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you for this briefing again. And uh, we know that you are a very seasoned diplomat. That you know how you are well armed to avoid direct question. But going really back to the first question of my colleague that you uh, defined as hypothetical, are you saying, Mr. Ambassador, that those very strong words by the U.S. Ambassador at the Security Council on the account of North Korea are totally to be dismissed? Those are empty rhetoric or what? Are you dismissing the possibility, the war option, to be the final option there? And do you actually taking that uh, responsibility that on time you are not addressing that this well? Well, thank you. Um, as I said, um, the clarification of Ambassador Haley's statement should be addressed to Ambassador Haley. I cannot represent her. I think that's all I can say. I'm not dismissing or ignoring what she said. Everyone heard it. She meant, I'm sure, it as a message to different parties. I don't think I can say any more than that. Is Japan afraid of that option? Well, wh what option? <laughs> of that option. So well, of is the, it? Of the option that... Uh, of the option that nuclear weapons may be used. Obviously, Japan is being the only nation that has suffered uh, the nuclear attack in the war. We, uh, very, we have very strong feelings about the development of nuclear that is being done by uh, DPRK. We need, feel very strongly that it needs to be stopped. And we obviously are not looking for a military solution ourselves. I don't think anybody likes a military solution. We are trying in the Security Council to find a way to make DPRK change its policy. And that is a role we play here. And that is a role that I'll be playing as president of the Security Council. Can I maybe the last question? Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Stefano Vaccara, Radio Radical in Rome, and La Voce di New York. Um, first, in the program, unless I didn't see well, I j just noticed there is probably no Libya because it was very present uh, just the last month, or because uh, Japan doesn't, the presidency doesn't, doesn't, didn't include it for other reasons. Um, and then about uh, the problem that we all talking today, um, North Korea. I th um, well, we all know that diplomacy, the art diplomacy is really thinking. Sometimes you have to think, uh, put yourself in uh, somebody else's shoes. Um, and I have a straight question. 
in 90, uh, starting in, 90, in 2004, when Iraq was, uh, the, when there was a war in Iraq, and then Libya. Libya was attacked uh, 2011. The issue of uh, weapon of mass destruction was always there. And it happened that those countries didn't have it. Actually, Libya had just released its weapon of mass destruction. Mm -hmm. So I ask to the diplomat here, if not the president of the Security Council, but to the Japanese diplomat, is it possible that what we see in acceleration and it's a coincidence that it's been just in the last uh, 15, 20 years. The acceleration of, uh, of this uh, race to nuclear weapons from North Korea is a coincidence that he's matched exactly this timing after country were attacked and they didn't have weapons of mass destruction. Um. Well, it is a rather big question, um, but what I can say is that what we would like to see is denuclearized North Korea. If the North Koreans decide to denuclearize, they can live in peace with its neighbors. I think that is, that is very clear, and that is uh, the option that is being shown to them by its neighbors. Uh, Iraq, uh, Libya, I think it's, they had their own history, uh, quite different from that of North Korea. Uh, North Korea definitely has had its own history. We have been trying to help them get out of this nuclear problem by suggesting different ideas. We had the, what we call the KEDO uh, um, project, following up on the agreed framework um, that was dealt, um, you know, agreed on be between North Korea uh, and the United States. We've had the six party talks in which its neighbors, including Japan, China, Russia, United States, and ROK, together with North Korea, agreed on certain ways of dealing with this. There was this joint statement in 2005, I think you know. And without carrying that out, they had a nuclear test the following year. So we feel that we would certainly like to have them change their policy peacefully. That is our aim. But they would have to show to us that they are willing to talk in a serious way. That's what we are looking for. Talk for the sake of just talking doesn't take us anywhere. That is the last, that is the lesson that we learned from the last 20 years. We want them to change their policy. Uh, thank you very much for coming today. Um, Ambassador is going to have another uh, next appointment, so uh, that's all for the com press conference. And thank you very much again, and have a nice weekend. Yes, we look forward to seeing you from time to time. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you.